chat after it or that. Yeah, no but, uh, well, that's fine. But Connor, thank you for coming on because I know that you're probably a very busy guy. And uh, we're all busy, we've got lives, we've got everything going on, so I do appreciate you coming on for a quick chat. And uh, we'll talk all things music, and I'm sure that I'll come away from it a, a better man as a result. But uh, the good thing is, Connor, obviously I don't know much about yourself, so, you know, I I'm going to find out some stuff. So, going way back though, where are you originally from? I'm from Glasgow, uh, well just outside Glasgow, Moody'sburn. Um, is where I'm originally from, which is near like Cumbernauld, just a wee farm village. Okay. I know, I know Moody's one. I've got some oh, family yeah. about that way. Passed it a million times to get to Glasgow as well. Yeah, everyone goes by it. That's that's the thing, I. And uh, you've got so obviously you're you're playing, you're singing. Are you playing bass as well? No, no, no. So I, I just I sing and I, and I play guitar on like half of the tracks when we play live. We've got Lawrence on guitar. Where's yes. Lawrence from? Lawrence is from Dunfermline. Dunfermline, right? That, that's more my neck of the woods. That's about Aye. 20 minutes. Where are you and, from? Uh, I'm Stenhouse Muir. Oh, okay. Right, aye. Not far from Falkirk, okay? Yeah. And yeah. we've got Graham. Graham yeah. on drums. Where's Graham from? Graham's from Greenock. Right, okay. So, um, so growing up, Obviously, you can't speak to the other guys. We'll talk about yourself. We'll find all, all about, out about yourself. So, growing up, were you into music when you were really, really young? Yeah, I, I was always into music. Um, my dad uh, plays music and uh, just was always singing about the house and playing guitar and stuff like that. And so it was always something that was in my life and something that I was interested in. And... Um, Sort of like all my dad's sides, like my, my aunts and uncles and my cousins, all sing and, and are kind of musically inclined. And yeah. would, when I was kind of younger, or when, when we kind of have parties with, with my dad's side of the family, like the guitar will get out and everyone will kind of sing a song and it will kind of get passed around uh, everybody. And so, so music's always been a part of my life. That's, that's probably very much been a, a big influence on yourself. Seeing yeah. when you were growing up, what? What kind of uh, music was your dad listening to? Oh my dad! Well, my dad's big into the you know like the the kind of classic rock bands of the seventies. So you know, it was a lot of like Thin Lizzy, Bad Company, Queen, um, yeah. Gary Moore, uh, a lot of stuff like that. Um, but then it was also like U uh, two, Simply Red, um, yeah. you know, some of the stuff that was maybe about when he was kind of an easy like, probably about my age, mid to late twenties. Um, yeah. a lot of that stuff around as well so it was a kind of mix of like classic rock and then the kind of like late 80s kind of pop rock bands so, see, um, so obviously growing up you, you are influenced by by your parents you know your dad your dad's playing guitar he's playing music um, yeah. as a influence but what age were you when you everybody normally kind of hits an age where they kind of get their own musical taste, they discover a band or they discover something and it sets them off on a path. Yeah. What age were you? Do you remember who it was that you discovered that kind of changed your direction and you kind of got your own bit of music for yourself? Yeah, I was um, I was 10 and I discovered Green Day, um, which is my, that was the first band that I like, heard and was like, they were a band that, you know, my dad wasn't really into them and nobody that I knew really was into them. Um, and I just mm -hmm. sort of like discovered that sound and there was just something about it that really excited me and, and really uh, captivated me um, and uh, I, I literally like, you know, I don't even know how I heard them but I just remember hearing them and being like, I need to go and buy an album or something like that and I went went out with my, my, my parents and bought uh, American Idiot, that was the first album I ever bought. Yeah, well it was massive, it was everywhere. Yeah, that was huge. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I probably, similar to yourself, I was about 10 um, when I, and it was a friend that came down and it, he put a cassette tape and it was Master of Puppets by Metallica. Oh, right. yeah, but, yeah. but I think I'm probably a wee bit older than yourself, so, I mean, I discovered Green Day, but it was Dookie. Yeah. So, yeah, 1993, yeah. 94. Don't get me wrong, American Idiot was brilliant as well. Yeah. Uh, Nimrod was a great album, um, but... Uh, Green Day are just one of those bands. They just they don't they're not slowing down. They just no. keep going. Yeah, and no, they're still got plenty of miles left in them as well. 
they've had a real staying power, and I think you know the fact that they've got you know because like my brothers are, are a bit older than me, and, and my older brother Kevin, who's really into music as well, um, he knew he discovered Green Day at Dookie because he's, he's a bit older than yeah. me, um, and and I discovered them at American Idiot, and I just find it quite amazing that they've got almost like two generation defining albums, um, for yeah. like two different generations. Like it's it's quite quite crazy. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, it's also great, I suppose, because when you discover them, you've got all these albums to go back on to check out and yeah. discover as well, yeah, as well man. as any new that's coming out. Yeah, exactly. So was that, did you pick up the guitar and want to start playing around that time as well, or was that later on? Um, I'd kind of, I tried to learn the guitar when I was younger, when I was about eight, but I was a bit too young. I was just... I didn't have the the patience for it, and and like it was kind of hurting my fingers, and, and it, I just wasn't gelling with it. So it wasn't really until I was about yeah, maybe like eleven, twelve, when I went to high school, really. Um, mm -hmm. And I just I feel like you go to high school, and because you've got so many different classes and you've got so many different things, your different interests get sort of like. Um, encouraged a bit more and so going into music class and having an interest in music already was like oh I've got this space now that I can go into and play guitar and focus on music and do that so that was kind of when I really started learning guitar and my music teacher at the time uh, Mr Drysdale kind of saw that that passion and was like all right well I'll put you in for guitar lessons with the like school guitar teacher um, and so that kind of started me in my journey of playing guitar as well. It was just that kind of like him recognising in me this this like want to play music, whereas most kids are sort of like, oh yeah, music's music classes, just music class kind of things. It's got a bit of a sky. Yeah, you obviously seen that that you had an interest, so he encouraged it. I'm guessing. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what about obviously you? You're singing. Were you singing back then? Uh, a wee bit, not seriously. Um, I kind of sang in my first few bands just because nobody else really wanted to. Um, <laughs> which is generally what happens with your bands is that, like, you know, the singer is either the one who can't play an instrument or, or the only one who is willing to actually go up and sing. Um, the one that's got enough courage to step in front, front of the microphone because there is a huge, uh, a lot of singing's confidence. Mm -hmm. A lot of yeah. singing is confident, definitely. Yeah, totally. I, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, I do vocal coaching and, and like, um, I, I believe that like a lot of singing is mental. Um, mm -hmm. I think that you can really psych yourself out of a good performance. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, you do have to have a talent, you've got to have the ability yeah. to listen, to, you know, you need to know whether you're actually capable of singing in tune, but there is a massive element of it is just courage. Yeah. Getting um, it. And I think that's maybe where a lot of people maybe feel that yeah. singing is. Because the other thing as well, though, if you're playing an instrument, whether it be the guitar, whether it be the bass, the drums, you, you can put your focus on something else. Especially if you're standing in front of people, that can be quite nervy. If you're yeah, standing yeah. in front of people, you can look down if you want, you can be playing your instrument. If you're singing, you're eye to eye with people, and there's a huge bit of it's just your confidence. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, I think the thing as well, the, the singer has to have that. They're the person that's got got to build that connection with the audience. It can't be, um, you know, you can't. I've not really ever seen a band where the singer has not been connecting with the audience, where the audience has felt connected to them. If you know what I mean, like they're the person that's singing the lyrics. They're the person that's at the forefront of whatever message it is that your song is. Is sending, um, so yeah, I mean, it's a really important thing to be able to connect. Yeah, I mean, they, they might not be desperate for the spotlight, but I, I thought I don't think there's any denying that when you've got a band, the singer is is focal point. They're the one leading it. Yeah, it might not be the scenes, but when you're on stage, they are they are the person that's leading everything. And yeah, I should say can the audience as well. But um, give me a wee laugh then, so. What was your first band that you were ever in? Um, so, <laughs> the first band 
that I was ever in was a school band. I think I was was I thirteen yet? I think I was maybe twelve. Uh, yeah. and, uh, it was called the Gap. So my second name is Gaffney. Um, so it was right. called the Gaffers. Um, and it was me and me and two other boys that I was in in music class with. And it was just like a we played at like the school winter. Uh, winter showcase or whatever it was. We played, yeah. uh, we played Wishing Well by Free. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's always cringy when you think back, but I mean, everybody's got to start somewhere, I suppose. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's one of those ones where, like, it was kind of terrifying at the time, but, you know, getting that experience at such a young age, playing in front of, you know, probably what was like 300, 400 people, you know, as much as they weren't really bothered to see us there, it's it's just that experience of playing in front of so many people that you've no idea who they are. I'm guessing that would that have been your first ever gig? Yeah. Yeah, that, that yeah. was like my first ever like yeah, like performing in front of a live audience. And it's that thing, you probably think back and let's be honest, most of us are, are pretty <laughs> rough on our first first yeah. couple hundred probably. But if you come off the stage and, and, and you still love it, then that's all that really matters, I suppose. But see, when you think back, I mean, it, it might even still be relevant today, but who who's your musical influences when you're, think, when you're up on stage, when you're recording, when you're writing? Who have you got in your head that, I don't mean you're trying to copy them, but who's your musical influences that just influence you each step of the way? Yeah, I mean, like, Billy John Armstrong from Green Day is, like, definitely, like, a big influence on me. Um, certainly performance wise um, because as a front man he's so engaging and he's so energetic and that's something that I take into my own performances Um, but I'm also a huge fan of like Chris Cornell Um, uh, I'm I'm also a big fan of the Arctic Monkeys uh, and Alex Turner like I'm I'm a really big fan of like how he delivers his uh, lyrics it's very conversational and it's very I think it's very re- relatable, so I like to incorporate a bit of that into what I do as well. So it's, I like having the the ability to kind of pick parts that you like from different different singers and different artists, and and implement that into what you're doing. Especially like when it comes to like writing original music, because sometimes what you're writing requires a different side of your voice or a different side of what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, um, so fast, if we fast forward, uh, Anchor Lane, how long has the band been on the go? So Anchor Lane has been on the go for nine nine years. Uh, I started the band when I was 19, I'm 28 next week. Um, right. So, so the band's been going, um, yeah, a, a long time uh, at this point, you know. Um, started has it been, this, I was going to say, has it, has it been the, the same lineup? No, 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 no. So, um, I mean, so I'm, I started it. I'm the only one who's like an original member. Um, just, you know, you start a band in college and you just kind of figure things out as you go. It's very, very rare that any band keeps the same members. Um, would be nice if it works out that way, but, you know, you're talking, you know, I started the band and it was just sort of like whoever I was friends with at the time or, or you know whoever I thought was a good player at the time kind of came out of the band and then people get other opportunities or they kind of find out that it's not really what they want to do and so they leave and um, so, so yeah. how, how, how did um, how did you put the band together were you at college with all the guys yeah so so I was at college I was at the Academy of Music and Sound in Glasgow um, and I went to college just to just to play music like I, I went to college just to find musicians and start a band I didn't really care about you know qualifications or anything like that like it, that was just kind of like oh I need to get this work done so I can stay at college it wasn't really about getting an HNC so I could I don't know become a music teacher or something like I wasn't interested in that um, and so uh, I just kind of you know there was a drummer that I really liked and there was a bass player that I really liked and mm-hmm. I pulled them in and uh one of my best friends joined the the college the year after, so he joined the band as well, and we just started gigging and stuff like that. And my whole, I didn't really have a plan. It was just sort of like, let's play gigs and let's 
figure out what this band is going to be and then you know we'll record yeah. songs and just it just sort of slowly built up from there um, and, and as I say people kind of left the band and came into the band and, and it just you know with every member uh, the band kind of get better and we all learned off of each other eventually it settles into the members that you probably got just now that that's what was meant to be but how did you come up with the band name um, so we rehearsed at a, a studio called Lo-Fi, which is just off of George Square. Um, hey, uh, have you been there? Yeah. Um, so that, that's on Anchor Lane. Um, uh, and so we we, it was, we we had hundreds of really terrible names. And uh, <laughs> it was just one of those ones where we were like, we need to come up with an actual good name for the band. And, uh, one of the guys... And the band at the time was like, why don't we call it Anchor Lane? Like, it's where we rehearse. It's in Glasgow, it's yeah. about where we're from. And so we were like, all right, that's quite good. And then the more I think about it, the more I'm quite happy that that is the name because, you know, we're proud that we're from Glasgow and that we're a Glasgow band and we've came through the scene because Glasgow is a great city to come from if you're, if you're a band. Like, I think, you know, from, from playing in, in a lot of cities across the UK, like Glasgow... It's such a great place to come up in. The music scene's amazing. You know, if you play to a crowd and they like you, they let you know. Um, and I think yeah. you're able to develop your stagecraft and develop your show when you, you're from Glasgow because people are receptive to what you're doing and they want to get involved, and that's not the same for every city. Yeah. I mean, if you can survive a Glasgow gig, you can survive anything. Well, that's the thing, that's because the if they don't like you, they'll let you know as well, so... Yeah, but see, look, look, looking at the band, then you, know, you were obviously talking previously about being on stage, the singer connecting with the audience and that. But yeah. see, with the, the actual band itself, yes, and your and your opinion, obviously playing in a band, you've got lots of band dynamics. Do you think a band needs a leader to help steer the ship with other band members? Maybe just happy to to let that person steer it. Yeah. I think you do. There does need to be a leader because every band that I know, and especially from my own experience, it's generally one or two people that are making everything happen and everyone else is just expected to show up on time and play their instrument. And I, I yeah. don't think that there's anything wrong with that. Um, like That's generally how Anchor Lane works for the most part, is that um, the social media is me... Uh, you know, dealing with like anyone that contacts us regarding gigs or organising things, like that's all my responsibility. Before we had the management team, any of the managerial work, like booking gigs and uh, you know organising recording time and all that kind of stuff, that was all me that was doing that. Um, I, I mean, I'm not taking it away anything away from the other guys. Your personality probably means you're best suited for that. The same with other bands, there's always one person that, that takes on that kind of yeah. leadership role. Yeah. I, and, I mean, I, th I think my, my best quality is that I'm just willing to do whatever I need to do to get to get to where I want to be. I don't, yeah. you know, within reason, but like, you know, I, I don't mind having to look after social media. I don't mind having to like speak to people and contact people. Um, the other two guys in the band will tell you themselves they're not they're a bit more introverted than I am. And so, like, even after shows, like, when, you know, people will come up to the merch desk and they're buying stuff from us and they're maybe talk to us and they're asking Lawrence about what kind of guitar he plays or, like, Graham, his drums and stuff like that, like, they get to a point where they're, like, my social battery is just depleted and, and they just can't do it any longer. Um, <laughs> and uh, not that they don't like speaking to, you know, fans of the band and when they come up and ask for, you know, like, the CD based sign and stuff like that, like they're happy to do that, but they just don't have that kind of endless ability. I think there's, there's something someone spoke about the difference between an introvert and an extrovert is like an introvert loses energy from social interaction, but an extrovert gains energy from interaction, or there's something like that. And, and I, when you see the three of us together, you can you can visibly see that. Yeah, that's, that's fine. No, that, everyone. Everybody's different, and that's what makes it work. But uh, see, look at, at the band. Is, how do you go about 
songwriting. So, for example, well, um, well, Lawrence go away and write a song and then come into a practice and say, right, guys, I've, I've got an idea. Here's a verse, chorus. Or do you just come in with nothing at all planned and just start jamming and see what you come up with? Is that a wee bit of both? Like, how do you go about songwriting as a band? So, um, the way that Call This A Reality was written, which was our, our most recent album, was... Um, Lawrence was coming in with songs that he'd been working on at home which was different from our first album because the first album was really co collaborative and it was very like all of us in the room and like I would be in a corner writing something and Lawrence would be over somewhere else writing something and um, whereas this time like we kind of spoke about we wanted to really go down a certain avenue of the sound that we'd we had just kind of scratched upon when we recorded our first album and we were like well that's where we want to go and Lawrence was just coming in with these songs that were just like that's exactly what we want to do and so with that Lawrence was like well look I'm happy to just kind of keep writing these kind of songs and bringing them in I was bringing in yeah. songs in the kind of early days of, of writing Call This A Reality and it was just one of those ones where I had to just sort of like <laughs> swallow my pride and be like what Lawrence is doing is more what we should be doing and, and just kind of like have, have that realisation that you know what Lawrence writes better songs for what we're trying to achieve yeah so see with, with Lawrence being a guitarist is he coming with instrumental songs that you then put lyrics to it or is he also writing the lyrics no, he's he's writing um, lyrics and melody as well, um, and we'll he'll come in with the song, and it'll be a verse and a chorus, and maybe like a middle section. There's usually some kind of ridiculous riff on it as well, um, and uh, he'll send me his lyrics, and we'll sit down and look at the lyrics, and we'll talk about like the narrative of the song, like what we're trying to say, what's the song about, stuff like that, like. Lawrence has sent me songs sent and sent me lyrics at like 10 o'clock at night on a Sunday and I've like phoned them and been like, you know, what's what's this about? What's that about? Like, what are we saying here? Blah, blah. Like, um, Lawrence will probably not admit this himself, but he's a really, really good lyricist. He just thinks about things in a really unique way that just translates really, really well to, to, to lyrics. Yeah, so... I suppose one of the things is you've got to leave your ego at the door yeah. for all the members. So, you know, if you are want, wanting it to work, you know, you've got to, to work as a band. But see with regard to his lyrics, see if you were to read them without the music. Would the lyrics make sense as in do they tell a clear story or are they a wee bit more vague? Um, they, they tell a clear story, but that story is very... Um, open to interpretation aye yeah it, it's like I would say that you would you would read Lawrence's lyrics and go he's going through a time of it but I really need to sit here and and, and kind of dissect this and to realise what he's actually saying um, yeah. which is good because I think when songs are too obvious they're less relatable mm -hmm. because yeah. if it's a bit more open ended and it's up to interpretation then you can make of the song what it means to you ra rather than being like this is what that song's about and then you know you've maybe ruined that listening opportunity for someone else who would have heard something else in it yeah and see that the three of you when you are in recording do, do, in, do the three of you enjoy recording or is it simply we've got to record to release something in order to get um, no I would say we like we really really love working together and recording. Um, like we were in the studio today and we were we were demoing a new song, and it's just like especially when we've got a bit better at doing it ourselves, like like you know recording demos and stuff like that. And, excuse me, yeah. and that side has become more collaborative and like we can go a wee bit more in depth. Yeah, I mean, we just have fun with it, man. Like, we're just sat laughing all day, just coming up with, like, these really wacky, cool ideas for songs. And how do you how do you go about recording? As in, does, um, does Graham put 
put his drums down first and then does it do you get do you layer on top of it or do you do some of it live? How how do you go about recording? So um recording our demos we'll we'll record Graham's drums first and then Lawrence will record his guitar. Usually what people do is they record drums and then bass, um but we don't have a bass player, so uh mm-hmm. and, and Lawrence and Graham are really locked in with each other. Um, and a lot of things that Lawrence will do on the guitar, Graham will accent on the drums. So the, t- the two of them will, will be like, all right, you playing that there, you're accenting that bit, okay, right, well, I'll do this here, kind of thing. So they are really good at working together. Um, where that would normally be like a, a bass player and, and drummer relationship, it's a relationship between the guitarist and the drummer, um, which is unique in itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it obviously works. So, so here's another question, and this will be an interesting one because, Connor, you're probably the the youngest person that I've had on oh, really? so far. <laughs> so I'll maybe, maybe get a different perspective. Maybe, maybe I will, maybe I won't. But when I was younger, right, you didn't have starting show page now. You didn't have the internet, right? Yeah. So when you went a music shop when they still existed that you could go and buy a CD, right, you would you would go in. And you, you could be buying something purely based upon the album cover. Yeah. So you, you didn't know what the music sounded like. You just thought, that's a cool looking album cover. I'm going to take a chance. I'm going to buy it. Hopefully you get home and you listen to it and you enjoy it, right? Yeah. Obviously, nowadays, the way the music business changed, yes, you still sell CDs, but a lot of it's streaming, a lot of it's downloading. Is artwork still as important? Uh, yeah, I, th- I think so. Um, I think that yeah. So I'll, I'll give you a real a real example of it that was to do with our album called Us a Reality. So when we were on tour just before the album came out, so the album was coming out in the January. We were on tour in October with a band called the Virgin Marys, um, yep. and we had posters with the album artwork on it and a wee QR code that you could scan and it would bring up the yeah, yeah. order page. Um, and there were so yeah. many people who were scanning that QR code, literally didn't even see us play. They, they were like, oh, I missed you, but that album artwork's amazing. And so they, they were literally pre-ordering the album because they wanted the album artwork, like, and they just were making a gamble yeah, on well, that, the, the song. That, that, that pretty much answers it then. Yeah, so to me, yeah, 100% is, is very important. And I think... It's important because I think there's a, like, music, music's funny because I think that music has been devalued quite a lot by um, initially streaming, but now I think that, that, you know, platforms like TikTok is really devaluing it. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think the way that you bring value back to your music is by having good artwork and having, like, almost like a like a story underneath your 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 music that goes along with it. Like um I don't know if if, if you've uh, listened to Coheed and Cambria much, but like all of their albums have a comic book that goes along with it. Like that's mm. that's where I think like you can you know obviously like we can't do a comic book now. <laughs> that's too much money but um you know I think like having other things that go along with your music helps. There's there's a really cool band from Glasgow now called Lores that um, they released an EP, and with the EP, every single that was on it, they released a music video that was telling a story, and all the music videos followed on after each other. I think that that's where the value of the visuals going along with music is is going is into telling stories outside of the songs, or telling stories with the songs, and visuals on yeah. top of it. So you also, um, you, you know, one of the main things about being in a band is you get to play live. Yep. Right? Now, I assume, you know, the band's been on the go for a long time, so you've probably played every single little pub, every little dive in Glasgow. Yeah. You then progress up and you're getting like your King Touch, your Cat House. When you've managed to progress onto the next level, because you'd mentioned to me you've obviously done some really big festivals. Yeah. And, and being a rock, a rock guy, the first one that comes to my mind is Download. Yeah. You know? But is there a difference? Now, obviously, you're playing to more people, but is there a difference between playing, for example, in King Tut's and playing at a festival? Or is it simply, it's, it's still business, it's still the same thing, it's just on a bigger scale? Um, so, 
the difference with playing festivals is that nobody knows you. Um, like right. unless unless you know you're you're a Metallica or a Bring Me the Horizon or a Slipknot or somebody who's like a household name that everybody knows and everyone's aware of. You're you're trying to win people over and you're trying to keep the attention of folk who potentially have never heard. Well, in our case, have definitely majority of the crowd has not heard a song from you before. Um, yeah. and that, that that maybe a wee a challenge for yourselves that yeah you know assume they don't know who you are, but assume but hope that they're going to leave remembering who you are. Yeah, I mean, like I literally just come on like a mad raven Scottish lunatic. Like screaming, you know, how you know how we fucking doing and stuff like that. Like I just, like if you just, like I, I'm quite you a back person in my in my general life. Like I'm not, I, I'm not like a everyone look at me kind of guy. But when I'm on stage, that's when I'm like I I need to be that, and I need to be that kind of like larger than life personality because no one wants, you know, the kind of regular. So, Day, day yeah. to come on the stage. Well, some people do, but I think. See, see, you're another two guys. Do you get nervous before going on? I, I don't mean nervous as in anxiety, like you know, you're panicking, thinking you can't do this. Mm. But do you, do you get nervous as in you want everything to go okay, or you're just desperate to kind of get on and play? How, how does it work for each of you? Um, so for me and me and Graham are both very. Me and Graham are quite similar. Um, we're both very chill before we play. We're both just kind of like getting ready to go on. Um, Lawrence can be a wee bit more um, apprehensive of certain things and just like, uh, you know, maybe wants things to go well or whatever. But the three of us generally are quite relaxed before we go on. We're just quite happy to, if anything, we're just kind of like, right, what time is it yet? It's like, you know, it's like two minutes to go and we're sat every, every 10 seconds. We're like, are we going on yet? Are we going on? Um, I'm guessing it's probably that thing where all three of you know that you're more than capable of doing what's required of you once you hit the stage. Probably the minute the drummer hits the first cymbal or the first guitar chord is played, the three of you are probably fine. It's probably just that nervous, I want to get up here and do my best, and you just maybe hope that there's... You know, the only thing that would maybe ruin it would be technical issues or something because you know that you're all capable yeah. of doing what's to make the show what it's what it's meant to be. Yeah, and I mean, like, technical issues is just something that like it's going to happen. You're playing live music; it's just yeah. it's going to happen. And especially like because we don't have a bass player, we have to run tracks. Like we have to run like a bass track um, underneath everything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and like that's that's went pear shaped a couple of times as as it can with anything um, but you know the three of us are, are solid musicians and so it's just like well you know we get through the song and then we figure out what's wrong and if we need to go without the bass tracks then Lawrence is a good enough guitar player to hold it down himself anyway yeah. So Connor but, but quite early on in 2024 so what is the, the band's plans for the year going forward what, what what's on the, the diary well the first half of the year um, we're focusing on just writing some new music, hopefully getting some recorded would be nice um, but we're not putting too much pressure on it um, and then into the end of May and the start of June we're going on tour um, so we're doing some shows down in I should have this memorised but I don't uh, down in Southampton and we're playing Plymouth and we're playing a few other places down that neck of the woods um, we're playing yep. the festival on the hills, uh, and then we're finishing it all with a headline show in King Tut's on twenty second of June. Um, oh. We've sold quite a lot of tickets for it already. It's actually been probably the most tickets we've sold for a show at, th at this point that we're at. Like uh, mm. how far away, how far removed we are from the show, which is which is really good. And it shows the kind of growth that we've had as a band. Over who's um? Wee while. Do you know who who's supporting you, um, for the King Touch show? Uh, I do, but I uh, I cannot I cannot say yet. Apologies. Just the reason I'm asking, the reason that I'm asking was there was I had somebody on the, on an episode. It might have just been the one that just came out because I'm, I'm a few episodes down, um, 
and they're a Glasgow metal band and I'm positive he said, he said to me that they're playing in King Tut's in June and I was just like I wonder if, that was, if that's the same show but it might not be it's a band called The Colony so oh, I don't I know, know the if you've heard of them yeah yeah I know The Colony yeah so yeah, yeah. Aaron the guitarist yeah uh, I've known years so he was actually on episode 10 that I done I see yeah 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 uh, no, it's not. It's not the colony, but um, no. I, I know those guys. We actually we share the studio for a while. All right. Okay. Yeah. So before we finish up, uh, Connor, we're going to do some. We've been quite serious, so we'll do some fun questions <laughs> for you. Right? So here we go. Are you ready for it? Yeah. Right. So let's imagine you've got a time machine, right, and that you can go back in time and any one gig. What? Is one gig from the past that you wish you could have attended? Oh, um That's a really difficult question. Uh, I think Queen in Rio. Right. That that's like I remember watching that a few years ago and just been like that looks absolutely tremendous. I've seen Queen a few times, um, obviously not with Freddie Mercury, unfortunately, but uh, yeah, Queen, Queen are like probably up there with, with like my all-time favourite bands. It's funny because I asked, I asked someone this the other day, and, and they asked me the question back, and I'd said Queen at Wembley in yeah, '86. Yeah. It's just one of those. I mean, obviously I was too young for it, but um, that would be one of those gigs you, you would never forget it. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, obviously, you're singing. Is there another instrument that you wish you could play? Um, I wish I could play the piano. Like I can play a wee bit of piano, but not really. I can play enough to like teach on it and and like use it to like see, you know, if I'm doing vocal warm ups. But like, I'd like to actually really be able to play the piano. Uh, I think that's such yeah. a useful instrument to be able to play. And uh, another wee fun question for you, then. and I think I'll probably be able to guess the answer, but if you could get yourself locked into a recording studio for a month just to write and record a couple, two or three original songs with two or three musicians of your choosing, who who would you like to be able to, to write and record with, apart from obviously your own band? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'd love to write with Dave Grohl. Um, I think he's a, I think he's I think you forget how good a songwriter he is because nobody really talks about how good a songwriter Dave Grohl is they just talk about how good Foo Fighters is but Dave Grohl is a like absolute powerhouse of a, of a songwriter I'd love to learn off of him um, yeah. and probably Alex Turner from the Arctic Monkeys I think he like as far as a lyricist goes I think he's he's a genius um, yeah so that, that's my two guys and the uh, very last question for you, and then I'll, I'll leave you to it. Mount Rushmore, who is your four musical artists or bands? Who's the four that you put at the top of the pile for yourself that are just perfection? <sighs> In no particular order. Uh, Rushmore's four, isn't it? Yeah, um, okay. Uh, so Green Day are up there, definitely. That's, that's their one. Um... Foo Fighters are going there, Queen, and this is a really difficult one, man, because I've only got one spot left, and there's about 20 bands that are popping all through my head right now. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. I've actually not mentioned them, but I'm gonna go. Uh... Oh, no, I can't, I can't, I can't do that. I can't do that. Uh... Who did I say? Green Day, Foo Fighters, Queen. One more. There's got to be one more. Do you know what? I, I, for just like the knock-on effect and how much I liked them as a child, the Beatles. The Beatles. Totally well. Yeah. Connor, it has been a pleasure speaking to you. Um, thank you for coming on. It was appreciated. Thanks for having I'll me. I look forward to I look forward to any, any music coming out. If anybody's wanting to get tickets 
for your gigs. I'm guessing just if you check out your, your guys on social media, they'll get the dates, they'll get the places that you're playing, yeah. there'll be links to all the tickets. So they can catch you on the Instagram, on Facebook, on your actual web page as well. There's all these places to go, so no excuses. Yeah, and, uh, you can get tickets I'll from Steve, Anchor, anchorlanemusic.com. We've got a, a mailing list. You can sign up to that. We don't spam anyone. It's just all band-related stuff. It's all good. I'll see if I can maybe come along in June as yeah. well. It'd be cool to, to meet you face-to-face and... Uh, and uh, if you see a crazy guy jumping on stage and jumping off, it might be me. <laughs> <laughs> well, but thank you, and, uh, and uh, good luck with everything that's coming up, alright? Thank you very much, you too. Cheers, pal. See you later on. <laughs>